Amen. Any of y'all ever have one of them Sundays where you feel like everything just kind of out of sync? Anybody have one of those Sundays today? Good, I'm not alone. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, children can be dismissed to Children's Church, age 3 to 6. We're going to start today in the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians, chapter number 1. Let's see if we can't just get through that little bit of Sunday morning fun today. It's all on. Y'all, I don't know. It's all on. It's all on. It's one in day. It's all on. There you go. When all else fails, wiggle the switch. <laughs> yeah. All right. Philippians chapter number one. We're going to be talking today about being together in the faith. And the key is that little phrase... The faith. How many of y'all have heard people say, keep the faith? And you know exactly what they're talking about if you're saved, don't you? We're talking about the faith of the Son of God. We're talking about the gospel. We're talking about our belief, our trust, our faith in the Lord God Almighty. I'm glad today that we don't have a book of suggestions. We don't have a book of, of uh, fables. We have a book of facts. And that's exactly what faith means. The word faith itself means something that's built upon a fact. It's not, it's not blind faith. We don't have blind faith today. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have more that we can see than probably any other generation in the history of this thing called Christianity. We see prophecy being fulfilled all around us, don't we? I mean, prophecy being fulfilled is a fulfillment of faith. And when we come into Philippians chapter number 1, there's a couple of things I want you to see, a couple of important things that Paul says that kind of sets us up uh, to this idea of being together in the faith and, and being bound together in this faith, uh, the faith of Christ. I want you to realize this. As the Apostle Paul is writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God is trying to convey to him, trying to convey to the Philippians, and trying to convey to us, the, the church throughout all of history, that we can trust the Lord Jesus. We can trust the Word of God. We can trust to the facts of our faith. Our faith is based upon facts. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He became our sin. He died upon that cross. He went into the grave and on the third day, He did rise again. He walked on this earth for 40 days and there were untold thousands of people who saw Him. And we celebrate that. We rejoice in that. But that, my dear friends, is the faith of the Son of God. And it has a great big hook on the end of it. And the hook on the end of it is that one day the Lord is coming back again. And He is going to call us to Himself. And one day we may go through the portal of death to meet the Lord. Or one day we may just be uh, wandering down our lifeways path and God calls us home. And calls him to, our, to himself. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Right, church? You and I today need to be together in this. We've been talking over the last few weeks about being in unity and, and being together. And this is kind of the, the middle, uh, the meat, if you will, of being together in Christ. And that is is that we are to be together in the faith. There is not a hope so salvation, not a, a I'm working on it, or I'm trying to salvation. We have salvation because we have Christ. Because He is what He said. He did what He said He was going to do. And He will do that which He has promised and prophesied in the future. Uh, before I read verse number 27 and 28, whereby I'll get the text today, Think about a couple of things Paul said in chapter number 1 before he gets there. He said this in verse 3 through 6, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now listen to me. Today not only are we to gather together in the faith, but we are together today in fellowship of the gospel. I'm born again washed in the blood of the Lamb of God, saved and on my way to heaven. How about you? If that is you, then we are together in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I know that I'm saved. I know where I'm going. It has nothing to do with my attitude. It has nothing to do with my actions. It has nothing to do with the fact that sometimes I mess up and so do you. It has everything to do with us being in fellowship with Christ, who is the very gospel. Amen. He is the gospel manifest. Look at verse 6. Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it or finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. When you get saved, God will see it finished. He doesn't save you to boot you out of his salvation. There's nothing you did to earn salvation. There's nothing you can do to keep salvation. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves, amen? It's a gift of God, and you're kept that same way. And so today, when we're talking about being together in the faith, we are together in the fellowship, and we are together on a journey. And the journey that we are on, it's filled with pitfalls. It's filled with lots of snares and traps. And the enemy is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But nevertheless, God began that work of salvation in you. And God will perform it. He will finish it. It will be completed in you. Isn't that good news, church? Yes. Hey, all them people that didn't show up this morning because it's raining. Big deal. We're going to have a big time. Amen. Yes. It's a good thing. Now notice how, what else he said. You go on down to verse number 9. Uh, it says, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Not only are we to be together in our fellowship of Christ, we're to be together in the fact that we are on that same journey, but we are to be together as we grow. Our God loves us. Our God never leaves us. Our God never forsakes us. We are loved by Almighty God. And not only are you loved by God, but you are loved by those who come to teach and to preach the gospel of truth. You are loved by those who open up the blessed book and tell you the truth of the word of God. Sometimes it hurts us. Sometimes it causes us to feel anxiety and stress and pain. Sometimes we're chasing. But any time the word of God is given, it's because the man of God loves God and loves you enough to tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. And so because of that, we are then uh, able to approve all things that are excellent. We may be sincere and without offense. We may live that Christian life and that Christian existence to the glory of God and magnify our Savior. Paul went on to say this in some of the greatest scripture in all the Bible. He said in verse number 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Not only are we together today, we need to be together today in this matter of our salvation, in this matter of it beginning the work, in this matter of our fellowship and all these things, but you and I need to be together in the understanding that for us to be alive today, it's no mistake you being alive in this generation. It's no mistake in you being alive and seated on these pews today. But our life is to magnify Christ. Our life is to glorify God. And one day we get to die. And when we die, that's when the reward comes. That's when the payday comes. That is our great gain. Rejoice in that today, dear church. Amen. Then we come down to the scripture for the text today. Paul said this, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. Look at why he said that. Right after he said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, he said, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. Right? I just can't figure it out. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation, your manner of lifestyle, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, 
and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation, that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank You and we praise You for allowing us the opportunity to gather in this place. And Lord, I just ask you now, you'd open up our hearts and our minds, that we might be receptive to your word, be receptive to your will and your way. Almighty God, may we be together today in this faith. May we be together in the gospel. May we be together in the scriptures. And may we be together today to be bound together to fight the enemy until the day in which we get to come home. And Almighty God, I pray, Father, that there's one soul in this place that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Master and Savior that today might be that day of their salvation. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice in verse number 27, he said, Only let your conversation be it as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Right after he told us we were together in this matter of fellowship, not only after he told us that we need to be confident that God who started the work is going to see it through, not only after he had told us that we can be together and walk together and worship together and serve together and, and all of these things, and not only that, but then he said this great statement that for us and for him to live was Christ and to die was gain, then he made that statement that you and I need to be in a place where our conversation our lifestyle, our manner of thinking, our manner of speaking, our manner of acting, our manner of attitude is all about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Much easier said than done, is it not? But you and I today, if we start at an elementary level, we can all say we are equal today. Jesus is God. Am I right? Amen. Jesus is good. Am I right? Amen. Jesus is going to return one day. Amen. Amen. And with that, you and I need to realize it was the gospel seed that was planted in our heart. It's the God of the gospel that spoke to us and showed us our need of salvation. And it's the God of the gospel that saved our wretched soul. It was not up to us. Can we agree on that today? If we agree on that today, then we are in unity. We are in togetherness over the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. I can't keep myself, you can't keep yourself. It is God that saves, it is God that keeps, it is God that finishes. Am I right, church? Amen. All right, then let's be together on that. We are in unity together over those things. Our conversation, our voice, our speech just agree that there is only one way to heaven. That's Jesus, yes? Amen. And that Jesus is God, yes? And so we're our conversation as the elementary level is together. And you and I need to understand that upon that elementary level of the gospel and that elementary level of our conversation verbal about the gospel, that's where we start to grow from. And as we start to grow from there, some of us, we stumble and fall over little things. Sometimes it takes a while for us to get those elementary building blocks down about Christianity, doesn't it? I mean, for some of us, when we got saved, we may have had some problems with our language, didn't we? We may have had some problems with our mannerisms, our attitudes, didn't we? Sometimes we had some sinful behaviors. It took a while for us to get over. But as we grew in grace and knowledge, we started to get those building blocks together. And we start to notice as we do that, that our whole conversation, our whole manner of life starts to change. You want to know something? Today, if you still have a problem with the same sin you had, when you first got saved, and by that I don't mean that it doesn't sneak up on you every once in a while, amen? But if you're still walking around and you're still the same old person you used to be, you need to stop and check yourself and find out whether you're in the faith or not. And if you are in the faith, you will know that you're in the faith because when you do those things, the Holy Spirit of God will chasten you and convict you and rebuke you of them. Now, am I right or am I wrong? We just agreed on something else conversationally. You and I also need to understand that when we go through our life and we start to build those building blocks, there will always be opposition. Y'all ever read the book of Nehemiah? You'll find out there's opposition. So when you start to get rid of some of those sinful behaviors, there will be those in your midst that will uh, come against you. They will tell you you're foolish. You're, it's nonsense. Well, why can't you do that? I mean, if you're saved, have fun. 
How many of y'all have heard that one? I mean, if you're saved, then God allows you to do anything. Look, God will save you. God saves you to the uttermost. And God who began to work will see it under completion. But he will not put up with your foolishness. He has given his commands and he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you don't love me, you won't keep my commands. It's just the opposite of that. So therefore, if you're living in disobedience to the word of God, you are living in disobedience to God himself. You're not in disobedience to me. I can't do anything but tell you the truth, right? But you are living in disobedience to God himself. And what you need to do is stop and yield yourself to God and get that building block of your life established so that then you can have better fellowship with your brothers and sisters who are in Christ around you. How many of us know people that tell us all the time, well, I'm saved, but their lifestyle does not match that, that admission or that confession? We all know them, don't we? Well, I go to church. A lot of people think that going to church equals salvation. It does not. Amen. A lot of people go, well, I was baptized when I was 12, as if that's what salvation is. That is not salvation. Salvation is putting your trust and your faith in the finished work of Christ Jesus alone on the cross of Calvary and the resurrection from the dead. You do not go to heaven because you've been baptized. You do not go to heaven because you prayed a prayer or joined a church or did some religious work. Can we agree with that? Once again, we're in unity conversationally. Everybody still with me? Now watch this. I want you to see this. We are bound together by the faith of God. Look at this. Our conversation ought to be as it becometh the gospel. That means our language and our attitude, our heart, our actions, all of those things. We need to start getting those building blocks in place and build together as a great family of God and build not for our glory, but build for the glory of God. Today in our world, we see so many people getting together and building to the glory of themselves. We have all kinds of skyscrapers and, and towers and this, and even churches many times are built to the glory of man. Look what we have done. Look what we have built. Look what we have accomplished. We who are in the church are never to do things that magnify man and glorify man. We do what we do to glorify and magnify Christ and to make it so that men and women and boys and girls can see Jesus Christ and Him lifted up higher than the cross, lifted up, seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and me. Am I right or am I wrong? Sure. Now listen to me. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. Notice this, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now what the Lord has done through Paul up to this point is to try to tell the church there are things they need to get in order. And they need to get it in order because the apostle Paul one day was going to come and visit them. Now you and I may say, well, what's the big deal with that? I want you to know in the ancient world for the apostle, one of the 12 apostles, to come and visit your congregation was an absolutely huge deal. You and I today, there are no more apostles. Let me say it one more time for you Baptists out there. There are no more apostles. Amen. Apostleship was done away with with the 12. There are no more. Amen. Amen. You and I need to understand that one day the Lord himself is going to come back. And we need to live and be in such a way that when the Lord comes back, He does not find us lacking. He does not find us faithless. He does not find us in sin. But He finds us magnifying the Lord Himself by our very conversation, by our very lifestyle. Are you with me this morning? All right, now watch this. Are you still there? Watch this. You and I then are to stand fast. If we're going to be bound together through the faith of Christ, it is the faith of Christ Himself that we are to be bound together in. Look at this in Philippians 3. Look, look, look over here, if you will, just for a minute, in verse number 6. Back up to verse number, number 5, excuse me. Now, Paul, I just said to the Philippians, you know, all of the things that, that uh, are dealing with religion, we need to be careful of. He had just said that we are to rejoice in the Lord. And by the way, today, that's what we're supposed to be doing in this church, Amen. is rejoicing in the Lord. Am I right? Amen. What does the word rejoice mean? To rejoice, it means that we again magnify Christ with our voice. 
with an audible voice. That's what rejoice means. It means to lift up praises. It means to shout glory. It means to acknowledge with a vocal acknowledgement that God is good and God is holy and God is in charge. We're to rejoice in this place today. Amen. Not only are we to rejoice, but we are to be aware, beware of dogs. There are those who will come into this place that want to teach you damnable heresy. You need to be aware of that. Then he said, for we're the circumcision, not circumcised in the flesh, but we're circumcised in the heart, aren't we? You and I are not Jewish people. We're Gentiles, so we're circumcised in the heart. Then he goes on. Now he says this, talking about even though in the flesh, as a Jew, he would have confidence, he's not going to glory in the confidence of his life, in the confidence of his birthright, in the confidence of his family. And today you and I are not to rejoice that we're sitting in a Baptist church. We're to rejoice in the fact that God has called sinners, wicked, vile men like us, to be saved and to be able to rejoice and praise Him on this day. Amen. He said, though, in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I even more. He was circumcised the eighth day. He's of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law. He was a Pharisee. This man, Paul, was the epitome of everything on the outward that looked religious and pure and righteous and holy. Oh, but I want you to know God doesn't look on the outward. God looks on the inward. God looks upon the heart. Concerning zeal, he persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law, he was blameless. He was not sinless because no man is sinless, but he was blameless. He kept the laws of God. He didn't do it because he loved God. He did it because he was a Pharisee. He did it because in his flesh he was trying to magnify himself and show the world how good he was, how righteous he was, and how religious he was. How many of y'all know people at church like that? But you know what? Sometimes they might be all righteous on the outside. They might look good on the outside. They might be cleaned up on the outside, but inside they might be full of dead men's bones. So our conversation is not just the language that comes out. Our conversation is not just our manner of lifestyle that shows up at church. But our conversation ought to be out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of our heart, our body follows. Out of the abundance of love and mercy. Out of the abundance of love for God. Out of the abundance of love for sinners. Out of the abundance of love for our brothers and sisters. Out of that love, out of that on the inside, ought to spew out the love that's showed and demonstrated. And love that's executed upon people all around us. Amen? Amen. Now watch this now. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. If you stop and think about it, if most of y'all today in this place, you can remember the day you got saved or the time you got saved, can't you? And many of you were adults when you got saved. And if you stop and think about it, you, you were a bunch of sinful, wicked, vile preachers. You know you were. But you also did some good stuff, didn't you? You, some of you did some good things in society. Some of you did some good things at work. Some of you did good things for your family. Am I right? Not everybody's a total loser. <laughs> but there are a few. There's a few exceptions. Now, I'm not saying that because you're here, but there's probably a few exceptions to total loser. But he said, all those good things, all that stuff, I counted as loss. It means nothing to me. I count as loss. Why? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom, I, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Now look at this next verse. And be found in Him. I want to be found in Christ. By the way, I am in Christ. How about you? Amen. But I want to be found in Christ. Who finds us in Christ? Christ doesn't find us in Himself. He puts us in Himself. It's a lost and dying world that finds us in Christ. It's other brothers and sisters who find us in Christ. It's the world who looks at us and sees that there's something different about your life. And there's something different about our lives. There's something different about the conversation of a Christian, their manner of life, their attitude, and they are then found to be in Christ. One of the greatest rebukes I've ever had was from a lost person. 
who knows nothing of church, nothing of the Bible, but found me in a place where I shouldn't be doing things I shouldn't do and confront me and tell me they never want to hear about my Jesus from me ever again. Greatest from you, Kevin. But some of the greatest and some of the most profitable encouragements the Lord has ever come and sent my way is when somebody who knows nothing about church and somebody who knows nothing about the Bible and somebody who knows nothing of salvation says there's something different about you. There's something in your heart that I see that's different. There's some, what is it? What is it that's different about you? Has that ever been you? I want to be found in Christ. How about you, church? Let's keep going. I want to be found in Christ not having my own righteousness. Look, there is nothing good about this man right here. I mean, I know I look good and all. <laughs> Just kidding. There's nothing good about me. There's nothing good about us save Christ Jesus. Amen. Think about that. Our conversation ought to be different. Our manner of life ought to be different. It ought to be where the lost world finds Christ in us. Whenever we're going somewhere, other brothers and sisters in Christ find us in Christ. Wouldn't it be really sweet to be out there all by yourself somewhere and all of a sudden God sends another Christian brother or sister and you have something in common with somebody that's greater than the world is you. Yes. Now notice this. And be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. You want to know something? We are together in our faith. But the togetherness that we are in our faith is that we are in Christ Jesus. Y'all still there? Listen to me. We are in Christ. We have the faith of Jesus Christ. We don't even have enough faith on our own to get saved. The Bible says if we had enough faith, a faith the size of a mustard seed, we could tell that mountain to get up and move. And I don't have enough faith to tell that mountain to get up and move. I don't have enough faith to do anything. I have the faith of of the Son of God, because I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. And we, together, have fellowship together, and the fellowship that we have together is in Christ. It's in the Gospel. It's in salvation, because we have the faith of Christ. Amen. Family. Fellowship. It is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. We are made righteous today, in the sight of God, because of what Jesus did, because of His faithfulness. Listen to me, church. I am so thankful that you're here today. And I wish the entire town of Waynesboro would be in this place today. Amen. I wish the whole county of Augusta Amen. would be in this place. Amen. I wish I could reach the entire universe today. Amen. Because I want them to know this one thing. You and I do not have anything within us that's any good. Until we get saved by the grace of Almighty God. And then we have the Holy Spirit of God. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. We then have the faith of Christ. We walk in the faith of Christ together. 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 Not only that. But we're going to see Jesus. Because of the faith of Christ. Because of the obedience of one man. Many are saved. Because of the obedience of Jesus. Because Christ was faithful unto His Father. Even unto death on a cross. That's why we get to see Jesus. That's why we get to meet in this place on a Sunday morning. That's why we get to rejoice. We are rejoicing not because of what Pastor Paul is preaching, but because of the truth of the Word of God. Because of the truth of God Himself. Because God said, Rejoice! Jokes. Not only then are we bound together by the faith, and it's in unity. We're to be steadfast in that one spirit and one mind. Y'all did read that in your text, didn't you? And by the way, when we are in one spirit and one mind, we are there to strive together for the gospel. Look at that, if you will. Stand fast in one spirit with one mind. By the way, y'all know this. We, we went over this the other week. I'm just going to hit it real quick. You don't have to flip there if you don't want to. But Ephesians 4, we just read it the other day. Ephesians 4, verse number, number 3, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit of the bond of peace 
There's one body, one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. We looked at that the other week, and we realized there is only one way to heaven. There's only one family. There's only one faith. There's only one body. Come on, y'all. And we are together in it. So if we're together in it, let's be together. There's a difference between being together in it and being together in it. Let me tell you what I mean by that. And everybody in here probably can experience this. You ever been on a family vacation? We tried another way. You ever hop in a car and go somewhere as a family? See, you're all in that same car, aren't you? And you're all going the same place. But that don't mean everybody's in it together. You're just in it. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen. I want you to understand something. When you first start out, everybody's in it together. Everybody's excited about a vacation. Everybody's excited about traveling. Everybody's excited about being together until you realize you're not so excited about being all together. <laughs> That's the same way as it is in the church. You and I need to understand we're in it together. We're in it together. I mean, we're going. We have one faith. We have one hope. We have one heaven. Am I right? I mean, it's better for us to be absent from our body and present with the Lord in it. I mean, it's, it'd be much better for us to be in heaven than be here, wouldn't it? Oh, hallelujah. Yes, it surely would. But until we get there, we're all in this thing together. And sometimes being in this thing together means we're in it. I mean, like we step in it. You understand? Sometimes there's sweet joy and fellowship in the together. But I want you to get this and don't ever forget this. We are to strive to be of one mind. And that one mind is the mind of Christ, which is a mind of a servant. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's that mind, that heart of a servant. And the reason that we're supposed to do that is so that we can strive together to keep the faith of Christ, so that we can be in unity in our fellowship. So that we can be in unity in our doctrine. So that we can be in unity over the scripture. So that we can be in unity. Why? Because we are in a battle for souls today. Unlike any time in the history of this world. Now watch and I'm almost done. Y'all ready for me to almost be done? I told you some of us are in it together. And some of us are just in it. We're to band together by the scriptures. How many of y'all read 2 Timothy 3.16 for all the scriptures? Give them to praise God. Amen. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be thoroughly first. That's not thoroughly, but through. That means from the outside to the inside, back to the outside. That's conversational Christianity. You see, if you're th thoroughly furnished, that means that on the inside you're thoroughly furnished, but the outside you haven't really cared about. I want you to realize God does see the heart, but He also cares about your outside. Amen. The reason He cares about your outside, that's the conversation part that everybody sees. And everybody is to see that so that they find you in the Lord. Amen. Do you get that now? Now watch this. We're to be together over the Scriptures. How many of y'all believe that God wants all men to be saved? Amen. Amen. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. How many of you believe that God wants us to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God? Amen. How I many of y'all believe that God wants us to be godly and content in this life? Watch this. Flip over to the book of 1 Timothy. Let me show you. We are to be together in Scripture. Now, obviously, I could go through the whole Bible today. Actually, we'd be here forever. You'd be like that commercial on TV where that guy talking about the ship stuff from the UPS store. It starts out with a little baby in the car. The next thing you know, it's a little kid with long hair. Right? Yeah. If you haven't seen that, you missed it. Never mind. Bad illustration. First Timothy. Y'all need to watch 14. No, I'm just kidding. First Timothy, chapter number 2. Look at this. God wants all men to be saved. First Timothy, chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. I exhort, therefore, first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We all need prayer together. But there's a reason we need to pray together. And there's a reason our minds and our hearts ought to be on praying for other people. Look what it says. 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Hey, we ought to pray for those who have leadership over us so that our lives can be peaceful. I'm not a huge Trump fan, but I pray for him. I pray that he would, if he is saved, he'd get, get right. Amen? But he's a president and he ain't a preacher. Best we got so far. Right now. Means Hillary, and that's on tape. So, <laughs> I'll just leave that on the tape for future generations. Now look at this. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be what? What does that mean? God's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. It's God's will that all men be saved. You see, God does not will some people to be saved and some people to die and go to hell. That's Calvinism and that's a bunch of stuff to step in. That's South End residue of the more found book. How about that? You and I need to understand that our God is not willing that he should perish. They come to repentance. Our God's will is that all men are saved, but all men are not going to be saved, and even Jesus said so. He said, straight was the gate and there is the way, and few there be that find it, didn't he? Right, so God told us this all together. But we need to be together today. God's will is, is that all men are to be saved. Amen. It is people who send themselves to hell because they reject Christ. And it is the church who has blood on their hands because they don't go and warn the world about hell to come. But you and I need to be bound together, not only in the faith and by the faith, but we need to be bound together in the Scriptures. And if we bind ourselves together in the Scriptures, this verse ought to both motivate us and break our heart. Because we see people every day that's lost and on their way to hell, and it's not God's will that they do so. He loved the world so much that He sent Jesus to die. Let's keep going. Uh, look over in verse chapter 3. God wants us to know how to behave ourselves. Look at chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look down verse 14. I think I got it right. Yeah. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church in America today is divided over the behavior of the people in the body of Christ. Now, I'm not talking about somebody hits their thumb with a hammer and says a cuss word. I'm not talking about somebody that does something you don't like. I'm talking about what are the standards of behavior and conduct in the house of God. By the way, this building is not the house of God. The church is the house of God. And you, dear friend, are the church. And you are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you individually is what he's talking about here. And each and every individual needs to understand how to behave themselves. How do you know how to behave yourself? Well, it tells us. And without controversy, a great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It all starts with the gospel of Christ. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. You and I are to be filled with the Spirit of God, are we not? We are to walk in the filling, in the dwelling, in the presence of the Spirit of God. We are to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit of God. Love, joy, long-suffering, peace, gentleness, meekness, kindness, temperance. Amen? Amen? Then, not only that, we are to avoid the doctrines of devils. How will you know the doctrines of devils? When somebody preaches something that's not scripturally right, you know because the Bible says something different than what they're trying to tell you. Let's keep, that's how you behave yourself in the house of God. You behave yourself when you walk in the Spirit, and you behave yourself when you walk in the doctrine of the Word of God. Some will speak lies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Guard the way you speak. And guard what you're telling me. Do not condone homosexuality. Never condone homosexuality. 
Do not condone drunkenness and drug addiction. That doesn't mean we don't help them. That doesn't mean we don't reach out to them with the gospel. It does not mean that we don't tell them the truth. We are certainly to tell them the truth and give them the gospel so they can be saved. But never condone wicked and evil behavior. We are to abstain from even the appearance of evil. Am I right, church? Are y'all still with me? I told you I'm always done. That's how you do it. For it is, listen, it is in the Word of God that tells us how we ought to live. It's the Word of God that tells us the things that God approves and disapproves of. If God approves of it, we approve of it. If God disapproves, we disapprove. It doesn't matter whether you want to or don't want to. It's what God said. We're bought and paid for with Christ. Let me finish with this. God wants us to show godliness and contentment. Actually, I'm going to finish with one more thing because I just can't. I can't help myself. God wants to show godliness and contentment. 1 Timothy 6. You all know this scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and rain with us, there would be content. Hallelujah. How many of y'all have had food? All of you got clothes. That's what Raymond is. You got clothes on and on. You showed up to the church naked. I mean, that's a good thing. Right? We are blessed. We're blessed. We are a blessed people. And we ought to rejoice in that. God wants us to be content with such as He has. In this room today, think about this now. Y'all still there? In this room today, we have the gamut from those who are barely making it to those who have plenty in their bank account. But we're together. We're together in the gospel. We're together in fellowship. We're together in the truth of God's word. We're together. We're together. And you are not alone. You have a family inside these four walls that's closer than any blood you've ever known. Let me close with this. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And I am actually Actually, believe it or not, I'm going to be done. We're to be bound together by the faith. And we're to be bound together by the scriptures. We're in this together. But we're also in a war together. We have a common enemy. Our common enemy is not Joe Olstein, although Joe Olstein is our enemy. He is the enemy of the church. Smiling Joe is not going to tell anyone the truth. But he is not the enemy supreme. Satan is the enemy supreme. But he surely is a commander. He surely is an officer in the devil's army. Not only is he an officer in the devil's army, but every pastor that's preaching in the Seventh-day Adventist church today is the enemy of God. Every pastor that stands in a church that teaches that homosexuality is okay with God is an enemy of God. Amen. Every pastor who stands and preaches in, in every cult and all the Mormon denomination, all the all of that that garbage. They are the end, they're our enemy. But they're the enemies of God, and they're our enemies not in the fact that we go and kill them. But we need to understand that they are wolves. And we need to understand they have been enlisted in their father's army. You and I who are saved, we're to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We're to endure hardness, the Bible says, as good soldiers. You and I, as we look at this scripture today in 1 Peter 5, verse 6, you all know it very well. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I want you to understand that when those men who stand behind a pulpit and preach damnable heresy, they are yielding to their Father, they are yielding to their God, and they are being rewarded for it. Their God is not the God of of the Bible. Their God is the God of this world. You and I are to stand firm. We're to stand fast. Isn't that what we talked about right from the beginning? Be steadfast in one spirit and in one mind. Any man that teaches anything contrary to this book does not have the spirit of Christ. Listen to me. Any man that teaches anything contrary to the word of God does not have the spirit of Christ. 
spirit of antichrist abideth upon you. Amen. That, my friend, is something this modern day world and the modern day church does not want to hear. But you and I need to be together in it. Together in it. Together in it. Let's keep going. We're to cast all our care upon him for he careth for you. Be sober. That means to be clear-minded. Be vigilant, ever watchful, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast how? How? Time to be vocal, church. How do we resist the devil steadfast? In the faith. We are bound together in the faith. The faith of the Son of God. The faith of Christ himself. We are to be steadfast in it, and we are to resist the devil in it. We've got to be together today. We've got to be together in this local congregation. We've got to be together as the church in America. We have got to stop going by every whim of doctrine and we've got to stop going by what tickles our ears. And we've got to get back to thus said the Lord and be together in all of it. Together in it. And together through it. Amen? Now I want you to look at the last little bit. And I am through. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We all have the same issues. We've got the three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Every brother and sister around this world, I want you to understand, they have the same enemy that we have. There all around this world, in every country, in every country, there are men who are manifesting the spirit of Antichrist, and they are the enemies of the church. But the big enemy is Satan. You and I need to be careful. Because when we fall into enemy territory, which by the way, when you walk out that door back there, or you walk out these side doors today, you are in enemy territory. This room is called a sanctuary. It is a place set apart from enemy territory whereby you can be refreshed and refueled Recharge to go out and fight the good fight and war the warfare and be a good soldier. This sanctuary, a place of peace where we can be together. But when you walk out this door, you're no longer together, but we're still together. And we're still together in it. You need to guard your heart. You need to guard your mind. You need to guard your words. You need to fight apathy. You need to fight apostasy. You need to fight your own attitude. You've got to be careful. But we are together. We are together. Amen. We are together. Amen. And we're not the only ones that are together in this. Amen. There are some good men of God preaching the word. And there are some good men and women and boys and girls of God who believe the same way we do. And there are still those of like precious faith. Don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. Don't let that roaring lion scare you into submission. Resist steadfast. And when you resist, I want you to understand. Right behind you is a brother. Right behind you is a sister. Right behind you is a child of God. Because we're always together. Together, together, together. Together, together, together. And only together, together, together. Can you face this world? And one great day, when the Lord calls us home, we're going to be together around a great table. And the Lord's going to gird himself in service. And there will be no more sorrows for us. Let's all stand this morning.